Hello, I'm Doug Smith, and this is the 6 February 2015 edition of Portsmouth This Week, the voice of Portsmouth Town Hall. Our uh, guests today, uh, return guests, are State Senator Chris Adiano from District 11 and Representative Jay Edwards, House District 70. Welcome back, gentlemen. I appreciate you guys coming back on the show every once in a while. We give, gives us a clue as to what you're up to up there in the State House. Uh, last year, you guys were local heroes uh, after leading a successful effort to uh, stop this kind of bridge tolls. And I'm kind of curious as to how you're going to follow that up this year with right. another success. Maybe we could start with each of your legislative priorities over the, the coming year. Uh, Jay is the majority whip and a member of Speaker Mattiello's leadership team. Uh, what do you consider the most important issues facing the legislature this year, and uh, what do you plan to focus on? Jobs and the economy, exactly what the Speaker said when he um, came out this, this year. Uh, he laid his whole program out. It's going to be all about the jobs and the economy in the state of Rhode Island and getting our economy back to where it should be. Uh, we've got some legislation in this year, um, retirement taxes and then a bunch of other bills. I have one in to um, allow contractors to build on speculation and not have their um, taxes increased on the, the increased value of the property until the property is either sold or two years pass. So we're, we're all looking at different ways to spark the economy in Rhode Island. Yeah, one of the interesting bills that, that you put forward is uh, the one about the old laws, getting the old laws off the book. Can you explain the, how that came about a little bit? Well, I, that's a bill I, I learned about from Kansas. In Kansas, they had a new governor come in a couple of years ago, 2011, I believe. And what happened was he set up this co commission of the repealer. We had Governor Chafee at the time, so I wasn't really excited about having the governor have any kind of new commission. So I decided to make it a joint commission between the Senate and the House. And we would, every year after we, the, the uh, session ends, this commission would get together. They'd go through all the laws. They'd come up with a package. And when the session resumes the next January, they would bring them to both the Senate and the House. And they would look at different, different bills to actually repeal. So, they, so they'd look back at all those old antiquated laws I know a couple articles in the uh, in, in the local press have listed some of these things uh, that had to do with uh, killing a pig and uh, feeding a pig and all the rest of the stuff. Uh, Barrington, you can't, grab, you can't grab uh, seaweed on Sundays. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, very very strange stuff. Well, it sounds like something certainly that'd be needed, and and it's one of these things that might work in the background for the for the good of the state as a whole. Uh, Chris, you're a state senator and deputy minority leader. And you probably have a little bit different perspective on, on, on what's going on this year. Also, by the way, congratulations on your appointment to the Finance Committee. Well, thank you very much. Thank what are your key concerns, and, and where do you think you can help? Well, first, I'm going to jump back to what you mentioned about the, the tolls last year. Uh, a tremendous amount of teamwork on that. Um, I really enjoyed working with Representative Edwards. He was really the man on point who, who did so much work on that, and, but also you know, Senator De Palma, Senator Felag. Uh, who co-represent Tiverton with me. Tremendous effort. And now I think we, we turn our attention, for me, it, it's all about the budget. Um, you know, there's two things the General Assembly does. We, we monitor the state of the laws, you know, that big stack of the general, general laws of Rhode Island. And, and, and Representative Edwards brings out a good point. We're not maintaining it accurately. So there, there's one focus. We've got to focus on that. But then that other half of the job we do is all about spending the money for the state of Rhode Island. Eight and a half approximate billion dollars. Three and a half to four billion of it that comes directly from the people who live in Rhode Island that we, t we take from them. And how we spend it is critically important to that back end of how the economy runs. And so I every year about this time you start hearing, well, what's the current deficit? And we're already hearing numbers of 30 to 40 million current fiscal year deficit and we're beginning to hear numbers of 150 200 million dollars structurally turning over so for me now being on health and human services and on finance I, I think where I'm hoping to contribute the most is health care is a big part of not only our homes budgets but our state's budget and we've got to do a good job an efficient job uh, in how we spend our money on health care and in the budget yeah, I know there, there are issues with health care, health source, Rhode Island, or health care, uh, the, the affordable health uh, plan. Uh, wh what are the key issues here, and what do you think we can do about it? 
Well, and, and this, and, and I'm definitely going to frame the debate here because there's a lot of detail to be talked about. But essentially, Rhode Island, for once, being at the head of something, we're doing something better than most, is, is our health source process in that people are able to much better than they were at the federal level. Everyone remembers the problems with the federal website. Health Source Rhode Island is actually doing a, a relatively good job of getting people enrolled on a percentage basis. The decision we're going to have to make is, are we going to be able to do it in a financially responsible way for the taxpayers of Rhode Island? And we'll have to look at that. How much is it costing for us to do it? versus the option of having the federal government do it for us. Now, if the federal government does it for you, it's not for free. There's still a fee built into it. So that's the, the devil, of course, will be in the details. It'll be in the numbers. And, and a lot of that will be, you know, the House and the Senate communicating about budget numbers and the service we need to provide. Yeah. Well, I think it's, uh, it's, it seems to me it's very important that we continue to pursue this thing because it has been so successful in Rhode Island. And I think this is something that the United States has needed for a long, my personal view, a long time. Uh, and uh, I, I think if we're ahead of the pack, we're, we're, we're doing good and we should look at it in that light that we want to continue to do something like that. Uh, I, I know that a, a big issue here, as you say, jobs, the economy are, are, are the key concerns here. And one, one of the issues that's come up, and there are several different things going on here now about retirement income, taxing retirement income. Uh, I know uh, Representative Craven has introduced a, a bill to exempt state income tax uh, from all state, local, and, and retirement income, uh, including Social Security. I know the veterans have put forward a proposal to, to do the same thing for military retirement benefits. Uh, I, I guess the question is, you know, we're one of the only 13 states that, that tax these retirement benefits. Realistically, do you think we can do anything about it this year? Well, one of the things that we've looked at from a leadership team on the House side is that we don't want to have Rhode Island continue to be an outlier in any way. And because we are one of the 13 states that still tax um, retirement, we're looking to bring ourselves back into the general fold. Um, one of the things, you, if you look at um, H. 5,000, which is the very first bill that was, was filed this year from Representative Craven, um, it encompasses all retirement, including the military. One of the things that we're going to have to look at is when, as the bill goes through and as our budget becomes more available to everyone, we're going to have to actually look through and see how much of that we can afford to do this year. Um, we might have to put portions of it off until next year, logistically, but the speaker and the leadership team have made it very clear we will be removing uh, retirement in uh, taxation at some point this year, at some level. Whether it's we, whether we just go after Social Security, or whether we get to add on IRAs or private pensions, uh, or if we can extend it to military pensions. But we're going to we're going to do something this year, definitely. It just the extent is going to have to depend on how much money we a actually have. Okay, so w w there is hope that we'll see some action in this year. Yes, you know. My concern, of course, uh, the concern of the veterans here in the island is, uh, is military pensions particularly. And I know a lot of senior military people uh, have their last jobs in the military here at the War College or, or the labs or somewhere else in Newport. And it would seem to me that that would be kind of a deterrent for them settling down, like I did on the island here. The, the idea that you're, you're uh, particularly if, if other states nearby are not taxing that pension. Uh, so. Uh, it just seems to me that if, if you start looking, and, and you, you discussed the budget issues already. I mean, that's what we're talking about, trade-offs. Uh, uh, one of the possibilities might be, if you get down to, you have to pick and choose, try the military. They seem to me that would be an obvious quick fix for something, and it may help stabilize, you know, bring people in here to, to retire. If I, I would, the only thing I would add to that is, is that Representative Evans hits it right on the nail, right on the head. There's actually backside profit to this. In, in my, an, anecdotally, in my own private business, um, I, I see lots and lots of people in the military. And when I talk with them and they're getting a little older and they're still being covered by local uh, TRICARE, and we have a conversation in the office, they say, well, I'm leaving soon. Why? Because I'm retiring and I can't stay here. Yeah. You know, the, the, the military, it doesn't take long for the members of our military to learn from those who've retired before them 
that you, you can't stay if just for the privilege of living in Rhode Island you have to pay X thousands of dollars more per year. Uh, so there's backside profit when they stay here, they buy here, they purchase here, they spend here. We will still get the revenue just in a different way. Yeah, uh, I think that's a great way to look at it. Please, please uh, express that view up there on uh, uh, at the State House. Uh, one of the things, a couple of outfits have come up with the top ten issues of uh, of the, the year coming up, and I'd just like to maybe address a couple of them. Uh, but I'm particularly interested, Chris, in your view. You're a doctor, a medical doctor. Uh, the issue of of legalization of marijuana. Are we really ready for that yet? Do you think? Well, I'll start by um, saying, uh, you know, congratulations and, and good work to Representative Edwards, who was, at, at, you know, really tackling the tough issue when we went to decriminalize. That was a big step. It was a big step that, that took a lot of resources and took it away from law enforcement that was doing a lot of work that didn't really change anything. So I think we made big steps. Now, we also have a healthy medical marijuana program in our state that needs to be emphasized. There, there are medical uses for this product that are still being investigated and, and developed. I have to admit, I'm still now just thinking about the bigger picture. I think there's a lot to be learned. Uh, Representative Edwards and I were discussing this topic a bit. You know, he makes a great point to me that, you know, there are states we can learn from. So we, we might want to wait and see a little bit and learn more because there are pros and cons. Yeah. Colorado and Washington have a long way to go with this, this, this issue. I mean, they just introduced uh, vending machines in Washington State oh, yeah. where you can go and <laughs> yeah. get your marijuana. So I mean, yeah. it, there's a whole lot of issues to be resolved, yeah. and it's great that we have two states that are out in the front, and they're going to work through most of the bugs, yeah. and the rest of yeah. us can all sit back and see how it goes. Yeah. And if they want to go down that road, then we'll have a, a clearer path because of Washington, Colorado. Yeah, that, that seemed to make sense to me. I mean, you know, let's let's see what these guys do, what the problems are, yeah. uh, problems with the, the you know police departments and yeah. other uh, other uh, uh, people who are concerned about this yeah. before we take the leap. It, it would stand to reason that if you pass one law that legalizes it, you better have about a hundred more. Yeah. ready to regulate and, and think about all the details. And you know, really, if you, look at the, if you look at the background of all this, there's a lot of parallels to prohibition, going you know, back mm -hmm. to the 20s and, and all that stuff and, and how it came about and, and a, a lot of misunderstanding about exactly what's going on there. So uh, anyway, but, but, but that's probably going to be coming up, uh, you know, at some point, and I think the idea that we can learn from others is a great one. <coughs> Another one that, uh, that was interesting to me, and, and, and Chris, you may have a, a perspective on this too, is, is the idea of Narcan in schools. Yeah. And I guess my question is, you know, particularly in Portsmouth, we're, we're fairly compact, and the, uh, uh, our first providers, the fire and rescue guys, are like uh, five minutes away from almost any school. Yeah. Is this really needed in the schools, do you think? Well, I, I think I, the, on the Senate side, I haven't seen that there's duplicate bills, but on the Senate side, I, I had a conversation with Senator Josh Miller, who's chairman of Health and Human Services. Uh, and in, early on, I'm, I'm certainly interested in discussing it, and I signed on to the piece of legislation with him. The way I sort of looked at it early is, a lot like AEDs, and everyone knows now, AEDs are everywhere. These defibrillators, we put them in all, most public buildings because we've recognized yeah. <clears throat> you can't always get an EMT where they have to be in things that matter by the second. So we put an AED there, and it's a simple thing a non-medical professional can run. Well, uh, narcotics overdose is very similar. Seconds matter. The medications themselves are safe. And in most situations, this medication, if administered for an incorrect diagnosis, really poses no harm. So I think there's potential upside. I've yet to see a lot of downside. So I'm certainly open to it. But you're right. For some communities, it might not make a, little sen not a lot of sense. But <clears throat> I, I think it's worthy of discussion. On the House side, we look at it as, is this really a priority this year? Um, and also, we look at all the schools, I mean, you want to bring Narcan into middle schools, uh, high schools possibly, but you want to put it into middle schools as well. Well, if there's a need, I mean, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I mean, there, there's an opiate problem in the state. We've had you know, a number of o opiate overdoses. Um, there is a problem, but whether we need to have it in our middle schools as well is something that needs to be discussed. 
Yeah, one of the things when I was reading about this, it, it, to begin with, these little Narcan things are cheap, you know, 20, 30 bucks a kit. And they're in a low dose, so as you say, it can't, it's not going to really hurt somebody. Uh, and it would seem like a no-brainer, so we spend 100 bucks a school or something, and everybody's got a Narcan kit. I think the problem is going to lie in training people, taking time out of school to train people, sure. et cetera. It's like unintended consequences yeah. of all this stuff. But anyway, I thought it was interesting, and that's a good point. Do we really need it this year? Uh, I, another one that I thought was interesting was the Rhode Island Roadmap Rhode Island opt-out. Again, I, I'm not, I haven't read it, this thing in, in any great depth. It's 600 pages. Yeah, that, that's a problem with a lot of this stuff. Uh, is, is, is that really needed, too? Do we really need something for towns to be able to say, now we don't want to do it? It's something we're looking at as a possibility. Uh, it needs a lot more investigation, and it really needs to be further vetted. But uh, right now, again, it's not one of our major priorities. Major priorities, okay. Uh, yeah, I just, it, it's one of these things that it's new, and, and I think people are, are naturally afraid of the, anything new that they don't understand. And it's 600 pages. They're not going to read up on it overnight, I don't think. And the short version is like 150. <laughs> yeah. uh, the other one, though, and I do, I, this is kind of interesting, I thought was the uh, legislation about ethics uh, essentially tr tr requiring a, an amendment to the Rhode Island Constitution to beef up the ability of the Ethics Committee to actually oversee legislators. Uh, what, what is your take on this? On the House side, we think it, it's good, but we need to make sure that um, speech and debate are protected, and, that, and anything that would bring them speech and debate would not be protected would not be something we would look forward to. Um, you get up on the House floor, on the Senate floor, you need to be able to speak freely, you need to be able to speak and without any consequence. Um, that's the areas that need to be protected. Okay, so once again, it's one of these unintended consequences mm -hmm. kind of thing. You have to make sure that the language is specific about this stuff. Yes, but I, I think all legislators should be um, under the ethics code. Yeah. So personally, but would they need, there needs to be very clear protections about speech and debate. Uh, agreed. I, I think this, a lot of this discussion, which we've been having over several years now, comes out of some very isolated circumstances. Um, you know, I, I enjoy listening to the attorneys in, in my chamber discuss it the most because you get a lot more background. Um, but, but certainly the general principle is you have to be able to speak freely, but how do you make sure that someone is not speaking f to gain their own interest? And, and right now, we do do, uh, hopefully, a lot of filing. I mean, everyone sees the reports that we file, you know, every single year. Uh, you, it's, I, I think that the, in general, you know where legislators are employed, you know where they work, you know what they own. A and so if, if I, I feel as though a lot of the discussion now is about that last little 5% of the law about what someone can say on the floor. Yeah, I, I think there's a perspective, at least from the general public, because what we see are we see we see the bad apples, I mm -hmm. guess, it, and we see the kind of egregious uh, uh, lapses in judgment here, or if you want to call it that. But there, there seems to be we see the crooked things going on, and as you say, it's probably at just the tip of the iceberg up there, uh, and everything else is is probably okay. But I think there's a perception that we need some kind of watchdog, you know, and then. The question goes back to who guards the guardians, I guess, you know, so. But uh, I, I do think something to beef up ethics would be probably a good thing for Rhode Island as a whole. I think most people would, would look on that as a positive thing. A couple other things, and you know, one of the inter interesting things to me is the, the problem seems to be that the states are now competing with towns for revenue. And that's, that's a problem. I mean, towns have always depended on flow through of tax money, et cetera, from the state. And, and now we've got two entities kind of looking at the same pots of money and saying, wait a minute, we want it to go here. Uh, probably the, the, the worst example is that is this mooring bill. I hate to even give this the light of day because I think it's kind of ridiculous. But this bill was put up by uh, Rep Slater and Trillo. And 
the way I read it, it would increase the cost of most moorings. Most moorings are for a larger boat. It's not a little rowboat. Of most moorings to $500, and the money wouldn't go to the town. It would go to the DEM. What do you guys think about that? Quite frankly, this is just a bill. Um, I think that this bill has a long way to go before it becomes law and actually sees the light of day. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion amongst the coastal communities. Uh, my, I bet. You know, Tivern and Portsmouth, uh, Westerly, Jamestown, Newport. We're all very interested in this, this particular piece of legislation and making sure that it doesn't affect our, our coastal communities. Um, or the people who use them. I mean, I have two really good mooring fields, one in, in the, the Tiverton Basin and one in Blue Bill Cove in my district. So I want to make sure that those people continue to, to be able to use them because they, they bring revenue to the, to the area and they bring it to the state. Yeah. And just adding more fees to things sometimes isn't always such a good well, idea. Also, I think, you know, towns depend on some kind of revenue for moorings to run their harbor master and to run their boats and, their, and other stuff. And uh, I think... This, this whole thing, when I looked at it, my blood pressure went up, I have to tell you. And I think a lot of people did. Uh, another issue, and this is, was not on the list particularly, uh, uh, a, about a week ago we had a, uh, our new assistant supervisor for the Portsmouth School Department on talking about the Common Core curriculum. And a lot of this stuff relates to, to you guys because the state has to mandate some of this stuff. For example, like testing. Uh, standardized testing. I don't know if you've looked at the Common Core curriculum, uh, but I just wondered, is there a state position on where we're going with education? Right now, our position has been we need to look at it further. We actually put off the uh, mandate last year. The House and Senate Correct. both voted on it. Um, so I think we need to give uh, our new governor a chance. She has to appoint a new commissioner. Uh, we need to see, you know, she's made some new appointments to the, the uh, Board of Regents, and we need to see what they as a group are going to do, and I think we'll, we'll take our lead from them. But uh, I, I still think this high-stakes testing uh, needs further evaluation, and I'm not really positive that the Common Core is the answer. A number of states have already op opted out. If states like Oklahoma, yeah. where I believe uh, Deborah Gist is going to be going to, have opted out of Common Core. And, and there and seems to be some resistance to her going there, too, <laughs> from, among, from the teacher unions, I guess, out there. But, it, but I, I can understand, and I think you can understand, we all can understand the need for some kind of standards that our kids can be, can achieve to get the jobs, for example. It goes right back to jobs and, and the economy. And I guess the question is, uh, how do we get there? Uh, I don't know if you've looked at the Common Core. I'll tell you, I've looked at it and here, here's a question for a third grader. Do you know the difference between literal and non-literal language? I looked at that and said, I've got a PhD. I don't know what the difference, <laughs> I don't know what non-literal language means. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a terminology that's throwing a lot of people. But well, I, I, I sort of back even further up from the question because when I start dealing with issues like this that are outside my professional circumstances, I, I'd say, where we got to find leadership a lot hinges on who we put in this position of as commissioner because we need someone to take the temperature of where education's heading heading nationally what are the best practices and we need a leader to say this is where we need to go because i, I don't think getting down in the weeds and having you know 113 <coughs> legislators decide you know each one of them where they think education ought to go we need someone who's going to point us in a direction and and show us the data on why it's the right direction. Yeah, I, I can understand that, but I also, you, you have to recognize that w at the end of the day, you guys have to approve something or not. Mm -hmm. And so whoever this person is needs to be backed up mm -hmm. in the end yeah. by, you know, w what you guys are, are telling people to do or not yeah. to do. Uh, I don't know, it's a, it's a very interesting issue, and it's one that's going to continue on because... Uh, I, I guess if I was a teacher, I'd kind of be feel like I was being whipsawed here. Uh, you know, on the one hand, you want to do well for your kids. You want your kids to be able to, to achieve what they, what they can. Uh, on the other hand, you're trying to do things according to this plan, yeah. w which has got some resistance from all around. So I, it's something we're going to hopefully follow up on a little bit on Portsmouth this week as I we go I think one forward. of the things we need to do, look at, is to keep the politicians out of the issue and let the professionals come up with a program and we'll just vet it completely and let, let them 
come up with a program that's, that they think is going to work yeah. and have yeah. that be the program, as opposed to having like 113 members of the General Assembly yeah. coming up with some half-cocked, yeah. half-baked program. Yeah. And, and, and I, because I think the real take home is, I mean, your point absolutely is, is going to, you know, we're going to have a say in making sure that it's appropriate. But in, if, you, if you're a student going through high school in the state of Rhode Island in the last four years, first you were going to have to take a standardized test, then you weren't. Then you were, then you weren't. Then there were exceptions. So we need a governor and a commissioner and a department of education that's laying out a plan so that people can begin to feel firm in, in what's going on in education. Yeah, I, no, I, I agree with that 100%. I, but I guess the other thing I'm thinking is that we're not in this alone. we got everybody else in the country. In fact, we have international yeah. people looking at all this stuff. They're, they're, they have come up, that's what this Common Core is. It's simply a, a set of standards that has been agreed upon by a lot of people. Uh, uh, but I think you're right. It's, we've got to get our stuff together because right now the kids, it's got to be confusing mm -hmm. if you're a kid. If you're a kid trying to get into college, what do I do? You know, that kind of stuff, and it's tough. And, and we seem to change directions every chance we yeah, can get. Yeah. Uh, and our schools are good. Don't get me wrong. It's just that I, I just see this thing as kind of being a bureaucratic nightmare right now. And uh, I'd like to see the thing go forward and, and come up with a positive outcome. And speaking about great schools, we just had the uh, Fort Barton School in Tiverton was recognized as a blue ribbon school nationally. Ah, one nice. of three in the state. Nice. So, and it was both in our district. So, and, and what's the criteria? Was it's it? all through the U.S. Department of Education. Oh, there was a huge amount of criteria, but they were able to successfully get the school to be uh, recognized as a blue ribbon school. That's great. Congratulations then to them. And congratulations to the teachers. We didn't have anything That's to do right. with it. That's right. <laughs> yeah, but you guys could take the credit. Isn't That's that what right. you guys do? <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're sort of running out of time here again, as we usually do, but uh, I note that the um, uh, the recent snowstorms, which never seem to end, we're, we're going to get another one in a couple of days, forced the cancellation of the of the town council and school committee meeting with you guys to discuss their their legislative priorities. Uh, I assume you guys have read at least the towns. I don't know if I've seen the schools yet. Uh, and we'll be meeting with them at some point to discuss some of these? Next Monday night at 7 o'clock. Are, are there any particular that you, that you want to comment on in the short time we have remaining to us? Uh, I, I think that the one that I always see, and it's been there year after year, and we've got to keep focusing on is getting rid of unfunded mandates. Now, it's an easy thing to say, yeah. but in practice, wherever we can, we have to find ways to not make the town spend money on things that they don't necessarily have to spend money on. There, there's a focus, and it does go back to what Rep. Edwards was, was talking about with his legislation. We've got to go find the things that we don't necessarily have to make people do. And then that, that's the key. Yeah, I wonder. The, uh, the, the permanently blocking the tolls, that's not something we can do. I mean, you can't, we can't bar any future General Assembly from pr providing something or changing something yeah. in the future. Okay, well, so. that's a good point and one I hadn't thought about before. Gentlemen, we're out of time. And I'd like to thank you very much for coming in. And I hope, I'd like to see you guys, like, maybe on a quarterly basis to come in and just give us an update on all these things you guys are involved in. It'd be great. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you. We'll see you again next time on Portsmouth This Week.